Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Piedirico and Daniel Coca. Hello, everyone. This is Adapia, and I am so pleased to welcome you to Real Wealth, Real Health, especially as this is our first episode. Dan and I are excited to host this podcast where we'll be sharing expertise, insights, strategies, tactics, wisdom, and inspiration from a variety of people in Alpha Investing's network. Our community is made up of professionals from all walks of life, from entrepreneurs and startup founders to doctors, lawyers, dentists, and especially real estate and investment experts. We aim to bring you insightful, interesting, and inspirational stories, as well as achievable strategies to help you build your healthy financial foundation for today and for the future. Now, Dan's gonna introduce our guest today, and I sincerely hope that you'll enjoy the conversation as much as we did. Dan, I'll let you take it away. Today, we'll hear some very insightful thoughts from Dr. Adam Gower. He has experienced the entire spectrum of real estate work, starting out pulling wires on a construction site in his younger years, and then moving into operational development, and capital raising roles over the course of his career. He's seen real estate from all angles. This episode is a must listen for any new real estate investor and a worthy use of time for anyone else. Adam will talk a bit about the importance of experience, particularly working with sponsors who have gone through multiple market cycles as history is often the best teacher. He'll talk about his experiences through the Great Recession and the importance of good debt and the right relationships and what can happen when you have neither. We'll also learn a bit from Adam about how to evaluate sponsors when we're at or near market cycle peaks like many experts think we are now. They'll share what questions to ask to determine if a sponsor is providing you with marketing fluff or if their underwriting numbers are actually conservative. They'll remind us about the positive correlation between deals marketed with higher return projections and the number of interested investors. Sponsors know this fact too and will often underwrite to numbers they know will be more marketable even if they're not realistic. All in all, we'll hear today from someone who is legitimately a real estate jack of all trades and we'll learn more about how to build wealth through long-term real estate investing. We're very excited to introduce Dr. Adam Gower. You know, one of the, the reasons that we were really excited to have you on or to have you as one of our initial guests is you have a deep, deep background across like every facet of real estate from you know, the old way, quote unquote, up until doing deep exploration into real estate crowdfunding. So um, having you on helps us have a deeper conversation about what it means to invest in syndicated commercial real estate. So um, for the benefit of our listeners and our investors, um, can you tell us in your words uh, a little bit about you and your background? Yeah, well, so thanks very much for that introduction, Adapir. I was rather hoping that you had me on for my good looks and great <laughs> accent. I didn't think it was anything to do with experience or knowledge, about which I'm just going to have to bluff anyway. So No uh, way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I have, all kidding aside, and it's easy to continue kidding, uh, I actually started in real estate development. In 1982, before not, uh, I started pulling wires for an electrician in San Diego. And so I got to understand real estate construction really from the ground up. I was a laborer and then an apprentice. <laughs> That's what I did. Uh, and the reason that I am willing to go back so far and expose my age is that um, what I have seen since then, obviously, having been involved in real estate investment and finance for that long, you, one sees everything. 
But the most important thing is having seen and gone through multiple downturns. And I think, frankly, that is probably the most important learning experience uh, or experiences that I've been through in my career is not just seeing the sugar-coated side of real estate, but also understanding that things can go wrong and seeing how they go wrong in order to be able to prepare and shore up one's defenses to make sure they don't go wrong, you know, for me. <laughs> it's all for the people I work with. Yeah, so wow. that's, that's a high level. That's uh, how I would describe my history. Of course, I go through all the companies I've worked for and ever. If you want me to, I'm like, you've picked my favorite subject, right? Which is me. So I'm <laughs> talking about anything that you want uh, for as long as you want. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you really, I mean, it's funny because you, you started from the beginning and like pulling wires. So like when we talk about ground up, that, I mean, it, it, it's exactly, it's exactly that. But you've worked in funds you've worked uh, raising capital you have you we've worked on both sides of the real estate equation is that right yes that's right uh so so actually i my first iteration professional iteration after i stopped pulling wires and wearing jeans to work right uh was uh i actually started to raise money for a developer in san diego uh for apartment deals and all of that was all ground up and all in-person pitches, right? presentations. I raised around 30 million in 1980s money towards the end of the 80s. So that was a lot of money in those days. And then I moved to Japan uh, to follow the money when the savings and loan crisis hit in the late 1980s. Right. So I went through that and then ended up in Japan that was also going through a major recession and was hired by Universal Studios, actually a JV of Universal Studios and Paramount to build out their Asia Pacific uh, pr project. So I you know, went from pulling wires to private investing to very big scale institutional investing. And there I also raised money actually from Japanese investors, but more important than the money because we had a $400 million budget or I had a $400 million budget. Uh, was the strategic relationship that the partners I brought in uh, gave us as, a uni as, a, as an entity, as an institution. So I learned a lot working for institutional real estate and developed, built a big, kind of very far removed from the, the ground. I mean, I had a huge staff. I started with one person. I ended up with 150 staff. Uh, in a very short period of time. So, and I sat in an ivory tower. <laughs> right. I just went to the job sites for the celebratory openings uh, and took all the glory. Uh, so it was a very different perspective. Uh, and then I came back to the States and did my own deals at Appear. I built my own uh, portfolio uh, as a developer after the 2000, you know, around 2000, and was fortunate enough to sell everything, my entire portfolio in 07, right before. Wow. Yeah. Did you know, did you, how much did you sort of into it know to sell in 2007 is yeah. like savant, like almost. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like to be able to say that I can predict, you know, that again <laughs> at the time. Um, uh, you know, I was waking up in the middle of the night. All I can tell you is that I was waking in the middle of the night, suffering from anxiety and worry. And I, I didn't know, I can put a finger on what it was. Uh, I had a bunch of very high net worth investors who had invested with me. Uh, some of them from the entertainment industry, actually, former chairmen of studios. And I was afraid one of them almost gave me the impression he was going to sue me if I sold out. <laughs> that I had, actually, I had actually brought him into the deal on the promise of building out these projects. And when I said, I'm selling everything, I'm out, I, I want out, he was really upset. So I had to, I really had to, it was a lot of courage, actually, very courageous to, to, to get out at that time. So it wasn't really savant-like, I was just, I felt nervous. 
and and I sold out right before everything collapsed. Luck, wow. really. Luck, luck, yeah. Time, timing, yeah. Uh, timing is such a big part of real estate. What are what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned as a private investor? Because obviously, like with with what we do and what we're looking at, we're um, more doing private investments than we are. You know we work with developers, but we're not developers ourselves. So as a private investor, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned um, building that portfolio and then you sold it off and, and then maybe have you rebuilt it since then? Yes. So, okay. So the biggest lesson of, so the real estate that I held onto, I held onto because my debt was low and what I, have learned working for other institutions. So after the downturn, I ended up working for running a fund, a debt, not a debt fund, but a fund, $200 million fund looking for distressed real estate opportunities. Uh, And what I saw was that the, there's, there's really no such thing as distressed real estate apart from, you know, contaminated real estate. There's toxic waste or something under the ground and that's distressed real estate. Uh, but um, the, it's the capital stack that gets distressed and that comes under pressure. And you end up with wealth transfer from one owner, prior owner to a new one. The real estate is still there, right? It's still got four walls and the potential for tenants and rents and everything. But it's the economics that come under distress. So the biggest lesson for me was to create was always to look at a deal from three perspectives, best case, worst case scenario, and most likely scenario. And that I always like to stress test the worst case scenario by playing with debt, because debt really is ultimately the killer. The bank is going to be forgiving, right? If things don't go well, you can always call your investors and talk to them, right? But a bank is is, is federally regulated. And if you stop paying, on your mortgage, uh, they will shut you down, right? They'll take the property away and sell it. That's what I did during the downturn. Actually, I managed bad bank debt and uh, sold from one owner to another in huge amounts. So that's the biggest lesson is to not over lever and not look for the super high returns, but be prepared to survive the downturn and, and take the long, long-term perspective. So what I thought was interesting, Adam, that you mentioned at the very beginning of all this was wanting to work with sponsors who have, you know, been through multiple cycles, right? And and that's something I think we talk about a lot, right? You know, you bought multifamily in 2010, you probably crushed it. If you didn't, there's probably a mistake. And, you know, you've got the Jobs Act in 2012, you got crowdfunding creeping up thereafter, technology making it easier to raise money. And so you've got this perfect storm of, you know, groups that benefited from buying in 2010, 2012, you know, selling 2015, 2017, with great track records, and now going into this environment where they can pretty easily raise a, a ton of capital. You know, looking back at what happened during the Great Recession and the fact that a lot of those properties were healthy, but they ran into, you know, loans that were maturing and they didn't have the right relationships to find new capital. You know, what are what are the lessons for people as we move forward in an environment that, you know, we may be at or near the, the peak of a market cycle. Yes. That's, I tell you what, when you talk to sponsors, here's a really good indicator of a good sponsor at this stage of the cycle, that that sponsor is willing to talk about exactly that question, right? <laughs> that they're not blinkered, that not only are they not blinkered, but that they are fully aware that we are at the end of a cycle. Uh, or getting towards the end of the cycle, and that they are thinking about it, that they are preparing for it, that they are taking steps to mitigate the impact of the inevitability of a downturn. And, you know, I've seen a few sponsors do some really, really clever things uh, that really give me an indication. This is not across the board, but I'll give you two examples of sponsors who demonstrate a, not only a willingness to understand that the market is going to go down, but have taken steps in their underwriting to assess the validity of a deal, right? And to decide whether or not to go ahead. There's two examples like this. 
One is cap rates and how they deal with cap rates. And the other is rents, right? So cap rates, it's really easy to say, we're buying a five cap. And in three years time, we're gonna sell it to five cap, right? Worse yet, we're buying at a seven and we're gonna sell it to five, right? Or we're buying at a four and we're gonna sell it to five, all right? That's on the right track. But what you want to see is that they are stress testing the exit assumption. Right, so you're looking, you take, in, you take into account where interest rates may go, uh, what the demand, supply and demand, you know, what kind of supply and demand we may have and where cap rates might go. So that's a good indicator, is to see a sponsor who is increasing cap rates for good reason over time. Whether you think cap rates are gonna go up or not over a period of time, doesn't matter. What they're demonstrating is a conservative approach, because as you know, that drives everything, right? especially if you're assuming an exit. If you're assuming a buy and hold, it's a totally different thing. The other thing that I've seen, I've only ever seen done once, which is very interesting. I actually remember looking at a pro forma that went out five years, and at year three, the sponsor, I looked at the, the rent projections, and the, and the rent projections in year three went down. So I thought, oh, they must be projecting another round of, of um, renovations in year three. So I looked at the cost, right? Where's the, where are CapEx? It's there, no increased CapEx. I couldn't figure that out. What, what's going on? Why are you projecting lower rents in year three? So I asked him and he said, that's because we are expecting, we are predicting a recession. Right? We think that there's gonna be a downturn and that we're gonna see rents or vacancies go up. So we're actually building that into our assumptions. So I immediately thought, well, I like this guy. Right? He's, this is, I'm going to look close at his numbers because he's he. This guy is conservative, like I am. So those are those are couple lessons based on personal experience of seeing as much as I've seen. A uh, couple of key indicators to me that a sponsor is being pragmatic. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting story. You know, I don't think in all the deals I've looked at, I've ever seen a sponsor you know, reduce the rents in year three. And, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's always been a product of the fact that, you know, real estate deals are marketed based off projections. They're unique in that way. And so, you know, these investment memos, they're marketing documents and people want to kind of put the best case forward. And I think when we look at sponsors at Alpha, it's always, let's get a sponsor who's showing us what they believe is the most likely scenario. And then, you know, we'll have conversations about the downside but I think more often than not, you find groups that are showing you the 75 to, you know, 100%, you know, you know kind of max output. Um, and so how do you as an investor, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you figure out who's, a, who's giving you conservative underwriting? Who's being aggressive? Like if you're an investor who maybe doesn't know a ton about this kind of stuff, how do you sort through all that? Right. So I think that those two examples that I've given you are, are good indicators. Not, they don't, a sponsor doesn't necessarily need to you know, reduce cap rates or show a dip in rents, right? But that something in their general positioning has overtly acknowledged the likelihood, frankly, at this stage, right, of the, of the market, that they have acknowledged the likelihood of a downturn and that they are articulating how they are managing that risk, right? What are we doing? So it could be something different. It could be saying, uh, look, we think there's going to be a downturn. We're concerned about it. And one way that we're dealing with that, I've given you two examples, but another one might be um, we're going to take lower debt than we usually do, right? Plus, we're going to take 10-year debt instead of five-year because we don't want to be coming up against a maturity event in five years when we could be in the depths of a, of a recession and we're unable to either refinance out of it, right, all our debt, or that we're asked for a capital call because we have to pay down the loan in order to be able to continue it, right? At a time when there's no liquidity or reduced liquidity. So I think looking at sponsors that have given this careful thought uh, and are prepared to talk about it. In fact, it's the kind of sponsor that I like are the ones who will talk about the first thing that they talk about, right? Yeah, we got this great deal, but I want you to know we're a bit worried about the recession that's likely to come. So you might not be getting 
the very highest return promises from us, right? But we're in it for wealth preservation and we don't want to lose money. We don't want to lose your money. We don't want to lose our money. So we've taken steps. So our return profiles, look, they're not going to be as sexy as somebody out there who's less conservative than we are, who's more bullish about where the market's going to go. We can't compete with that, but hey, take it or leave it. You know, that's it. I like sponsors that talk in those terms. Now, if you want, I'll, I'll just, uh, let me, if you don't mind, let me just take that point and pivot to crowdfunding. Uh, that's a great idea. I was going to go, I was going to go there. I was thinking when you were speaking about transparency and what's changed over the past, is it five years, but even 10 years in the way that sponsors approach investors and the impact of real estate crowdfunding platforms, online platforms, and how that's changed the game. All right, so dovetailing into what we were just talking about with sponsors. So there's, I've actually written about this. Uh, it's, so the impact of crowdfunding on how deals are structured is, I think, like this. This is a, this is a, demo, this is a, a an example of how things have changed. Now, uh, this is how it's worked, and then we can talk about the implications of it. But one of the impacts of crowdfunding is that there is now a lot of opportunity online for sponsors to raise money online through platforms, particularly. And keep in mind that there are a lot of my good friends are founders and CEOs of these platforms. Right? So I'm not saying anything derogatory. And they would undoubtedly agree with me on this. And that's why they're so careful. But here's a fact. When investors go onto uh, the major crowdfunding sites, what they found, or what the sites have found, is that there is a positive correlation between the projected IRR from this deal and the number of people who show up. Right? So what does that tell you? That tells you, people, that, that, tells you that people are chasing returns, right? You know what? The attitude is, I'll tell you what, this guy's projecting 20% RR. Everyone else is projecting 15. I'm going to go over there because you know what? If he falls short, so what? You know, he'll fall to 15 or to 10. That's a big problem. That's a big problem because that's not how it works. You project high and your assumptions are loose enough. You'll lose everything with a higher chance than somebody who is more conservative that projects a 12% IRR, okay? So, but what that has done is it has educated sponsors that, and I, again, these are gross generalizations, all right? So it's not everybody, but so it's a dynamic that you should look for if you're an investor, that it educates sponsors who want to raise money online that they have to show a high IRR. So what, because that's how to attract uh, uneducated investors, for want of a better term, right? Non-sophisticated investors. So we're going to underwrite our deal to show these great returns. By the way, I've worked for sponsors in my youth, in my ute, who had two, actually three sets of pro formers. And I challenge any sponsor to confess that they don't still do this. One for the bank, right? <laughs> one for investors in their pitch deck. And then the third one, is the one that they really believe is going to happen, right? And you'll only get one of them most of the time. So, um, so that's so. When you see these deals, Dan, as you've said, right? They're marketing docs. That's all they are. And if it has to say a high IRR, high IRR, in order to beat out all the other opportunities investors have, then that's what's going to be in there. And that is a serious hazard uh, for investors is to be seduced by promises or projections of high IRRs. You've, you've got to look under the hood. doesn't mean that high IRRs, IRRs are not possible, but it means that you've really got to look closer. Those that are promising those super high returns at this stage of the cycle, get really deep into that. So let me ask you about that because there's, you know, obviously... Uh, an element for a new investor to say, oh my gosh, well, can I trust what I'm seeing online? And can I trust what's on a platform? Because there are different types of um, entities that raise. There are marketplaces 
Uh, there are ones that do um, that do the underwriting um, uh, for the investors and present them. So if I'm an investor, how do I know that what I'm looking at is uh, adjusted an adjusted risk return profile? And how do I know that the there's an alignment of interests with what's on this platform versus me putting my hard earned money essentially at risk? So, gosh, that's a good question. So the first the first thing I have to tell you, the first thing that comes to mind is vacuum cleaners. <laughs> it's, it's the first thing that I think about. So my wife wants me to buy a new vacuum cleaner. And so what did I do? I didn't go down to the store and say, I'll have that one. I went online and I bought a membership for, oh gosh, what's it called? Damn it, I forgot. Uh, consumer Reports. I bought a Consumer Reports one month membership. And I looked at their analysis, their super detailed, ultra detailed analysis. I then looked at reviews and I spent a half day <laughs> right, analyzing a vacuum cleaner. They're probably all the same. And eventually we didn't buy one. I just used some duct tape and strapped up the current one. So <laughs> we're still surviving on that. So if you're looking to invest instead of a couple hundred bucks, right, on a vacuum cleaner, and this is what people do, right? There's no doubt about it. I think the first thing is don't be intimidated by the complexity. It's not that co complicated. Find sources and resources like consumer reports, although there aren't any like that in real estate, really. But find sources that you trust, that you rely on, that provide you with good intelligence that have demonstrated to you that they know what they're doing, that they understand the market and from which you can learn, right? Good online resources. And then use those resources to educate yourself about the general periphery of what real estate investing is, not periphery, but the general uh, business of real estate investing. And who can then also, once they've shown you that they know what they're doing by educating you directly, uh, that they then provide you with insights into deals that you're interested in, right? That they can almost serve like a mentor, if you like, uh, for your, um, for your exploration, but don't, don't just rely on, on numbers. You got to get detailed. You need to understand both simple concepts because even the simplest concepts are complicated and then drill down on the more complicated concepts. So you really understand what you're doing. Yeah. So there's a lot to it. It's funny because you're saying it's not complicated and yet it is complex. Right. Like there's like um, when you say it's not complicated, does that come from a place of experience of like knowing the right questions to ask? Because or does that come from, um, you know, in your experience, let's say what what's the difference between something complicated and something that's necessarily complex and requires more than, um, you know, a superficial look at the highest possible number as my metric of success? Yeah, so obviously it's a, it, one can oversimplify right, the complexity of this issue, and that's exactly the question you're asking. But at the end of the day, you know, I love to think of real estate like this. Uh, having started my career crawling in basements and attics, pulling wires, getting covered in insulation and dust and fighting spiders, I can tell you that real estate at its core ultimately is a minimum wage job right? You go onto any construction site and there's somebody there who is pulling wires. Now, it's not the electrician isn't minimum wage, but he's got a helper, right? And at the end of the day, that's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's anybody can do it. So at its core, it's, it's fairly predictable and easy to understand. Uh, but when I say complicated, there's just a lot of moving parts. And I think having a good sense of what those moving parts are and then finding those that, are, that resonate with you particularly. I remember at Appear being on, uh, raising money actually in 2007 for a deal I was working on. I was building 18 homes on a small lot subdivision in Los Angeles. And I was bringing bankers onto the site 
And what blew me away um, was that, or actually surprised me, was that one of these bankers said to me, as we're walking around, we were t- I thought he'd be talking about the numbers on this deal. And what he asked me about was the drainage plan. Tell me about the drainage plan, he asked. And I thought, fortunately, I knew what the drainage plan was. Right? I mean, I just, I knew this is where it's going to work and et cetera. But I thought, why of all things would this guy want to know about the drainage plan? And what it told me was that everybody has a different trigger point. There's something that is going to really be indicative to them of the capability of the sponsor, of the principal. So as an investor, I would tap into what your personal expertise is. Find that component of real estate and drill down on that, for example, and explore that with a sponsor. And if they can't answer you in a way that makes sense to you, maybe move on, right? Because maybe it's indicative of other things that they're not very good at and that the deal hasn't really been properly fleshed out. So given your, your background, Adam, as a, as a capital raiser, you know, there are a lot of new people to real estate investing today. That's just a product of kind of what's happening in the marketplace, popularity of crowdfunding, you know, this need to or desire rather to get into alternatives when access was challenging. You know, it'd be interesting just to hear a little bit of history, right? You know, you go back to 2005, for example, how was real estate capital raised then? And how do you compare that to what's happening today? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I tell you in 2005, I was deep in development and I was, I've, I was then and always have been and continue to be a very conservative investor. And I remember looking at condo conversions in California. I was in LA and I remember looking, trying to do deals and buy deals and competing with other buyers in the market. And I would underwrite deals to the assumption that I could, I actually thought in 2005 was aggressive. In other words, I was being extremely confident that things would continue to go well. And my assumptions assumed that there would be no change in valuations, right? So I just kept everything flat. But I was competing against people who, the only way they could have paid what they were paying for deals was by assuming that things would continue to go up. It was the only way they could do it. And and so I was beaten out on almost every deal. I was lucky. I found a couple of deals that made sense to me. Fortunately, I sold before the market did collapse. Um, but uh, they, they had underwritten uh, or they had assumed prices would continue to go up. And I think that there is a danger of that happening today. I see that a lot today. When you see cap rates coming down um, and uh, pricing continue to go up, it is not it will never continue to go up. So there is that similarity. And we are, you talked about 2005, we were right there. Nobody thought that the market would come down, Dan. I mean, it, and so investors also bought into that, right? They bought every, short memories. Nobody remembered the last downturn. And so people were pouring money in and consequently developers were able to raise money and bring up prices with this underlying assumption that things would continue to go well. And by the way, when I sold out and ended up in the bank, uh, being hired by a bank to work through all the problem deals that they had lent to, right, with the same, the same underwriting assumptions, this confident belief that things would keep on going up. One of the hardest hit was the condo conversions. They were slaughtered. And, And a lot of them were taken back by the bank. I sold the notes and then people took them back and converted them back into apartments, right? Because it was the only way to do it. But values were decimated. And, and a lot of people lost everything uh, in those deals. Wow. That, and so in, in a sense, right, thinking about that 20, you know, 2005 and, um, and now, the market is obviously different. There's a different macroeconomic environment. Um, there's not just primary cities anymore, secondary tertiary cities and markets have really grown. Um, and obviously like there's globalization, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. I know that when, um, 
you know, Dan and Farc and Ann do the underwriting for our deals, they're really looking at a number of different factors. And that aside, right, because nobody can predict anything. Is it true that in real estate, if you hold for long enough, uh. does that, is that a real thing? Like if you, you know, if you're like a buy and hold, like, is that a real thing holding for long enough? Like, and if there, if there was to be, or when there will be a correction and you're, you're investing today as many people still are, because it's, there's some good opportunities, you know, what, what kind of a perspective should one take in when it comes to real estate It's generally thought, well, there's the four walls, there's a piece of land, it's not going anywhere. Um, what, what kind of approach comes to mind um, for, for that line of, of thought, right? Like I have my building, um, maybe I just need to hold on to it for a little while longer or not. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there are two ways of approaching a downturn in this context. Obviously, there's a thousand different ways of approaching it. One is we think there's a downturn looming. So what we're going to do is we're going to invest in deals and get out quickly. We're going to try and beat the market, right? So we're going to only do deals that have a one to two year lifespan, right? Because we're just going to ride that last burst of energy that this market has. And there are some people out there who think that way and are quite happy to talk that way. Right? I mean, that's a legitimate strategy. It's not one that I personally uh, adhere to. Uh, there is another strategy, and this has been demonstrated with, through academic research. And if I didn't have uh, far too much going on in my tiny brain, I'd actually remember the name of the guy I interviewed for a podcast. I can't believe I can't remember his name, but he did some academic research uh, and uh, on 30 or 40 years of pricing data. And what he concluded was that the minimum period for safety is, with the exception of debt, you've still got to, be, you've still got to manage your debt. Right? You can't over leverage, because you can lose your shirts if you're doing a downturn, uh, is 10 years. So if you have a, if you have a 10 year perspective and you're, and you're able to underwrite a deal to a 10 year life cycle, chances are you will never lose that deal. And uh, personally, I have never, taken on a loan for a personal residence or whatever kind of uh, consumer loan for with less than a 30-year amortization, full 30-year amortization, full 30-year maturity. Even though I could have got cheaper debt, I want to sleep at night. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I want to know that I can pay this mortgage day in, day out. I don't care what happens. I just, I don't want to wake up and lose anything. So I think also, you know, among my clients, for example, the ones that are the wealthiest are the ones that buy with the intention of never selling. Uh, if somebody comes along and offers silly money, then they may sell, uh, but they always underwrite to never sell. That's 10, 10 years plus, right? This is multi-generational assets. We're going to hold these forever. Uh, and you know what? They, after a period of time, you start getting rents. I just rented a property I have in LA that I bought in 2002 and renovated then. So almost 20 years, I put it up on the market. 25, I bit out of tune. I shouldn't admit this, should I, on air? But a bit out of tune with rents in this area. And I thought, I'm going to put it up another 25% on the rent. And I got, I can't believe it. I'm still undercharging. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, long term, suddenly after a long period of time, those assets that you've held uh, become cash cows and you know everything about them. You've got no debt. And yeah, so I like long term personally. In this crowdfunding space, the syndication space, investors often want short term liquidity, you know, three to five years, you know, almost these commercial flips of sorts. You know, what do you, what do you tell those people or, or how do you, how do you change that, that mindset? That is a really good question, Dan. So I think there are two ways to answer that. One, try and explain to them why it's a good idea to have a long-term hold. Or two, talk about it now. And when the market turns down and they lose their money, they will see you as being a savant. So the next time round, when they get re-earn their money, they will come to you 
to invest with you. So in the same way as having a long-term perspective in real estate and the patience to really reap the benefits from what real estate can truly do to your wealth and income, in the same way, have the patience now, right, you, to just wait until the right time for those investors to come round. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, that, look, it's transparency, right? It's what a lot of people talk about um, and not everyone fully delivers. They deliver maybe their version of transparency. Uh, it might look like a marketing document disguised as an investment memo. Um, and like, it's something that it behooves us all as investors to really look into things and try our best to understand them. Of course, like we don't all have a lot of deep experience, but there are some things that we can do to protect ourselves. And now with this advent of a lot of online investing um, that makes it easy and it's all automated and it, and it's all, you don't need to speak to anybody. You can just click a button and, and, and invest. Um, it's made it easier and there is a little more transparency. I found too after, you know, I've been in crowdfunding for a really long time as well before joining Alpha Investing. And it, I think it forced sponsors to be more transparent. Like it forced them to show up with more information than they, than maybe they were used to in the past. And because platforms want to put stuff online. You know, because yes. So, so actually, let me throw this, actually, this question at you, if you don't mind. You know, I actually hate it when my podcast guests do that, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so, so there's this idea that through crowdfunding, uh, the crowd itself will do the due diligence as well, right? So if you're, a, if you're an iffy sponsor and you go out online and uh, you try and sell, uh, I don't know, a bag of tricks, I'm not sure what the correct term is, but to pack a lies or whatever, you kind of spin it that the crowd will get wise to that and uh, you'll be called on it. I mean, do you think that really happens? Do you think that dynamic is out there or people just consuming what sponsors are giving them? I think it's a bit of both. And I'll let uh, Dan jump in when it comes to the, to the sponsors. Um, and I can talk a little bit about my experience with the, the platforms and crowdsourcing information and diligence because there are a few groups that have formed a little like, um, I think of them as little like, you know, diligence squads and they kind of like form together and they, and, and they have some level and some of them have like a lot of experience and things. And, and they say, you know what, like I smell a rat and we're going to try to figure this out. And they have outed some sponsors. Um, they've also, uh, held platforms to task some of the big major ones, they've held them to task uh, when it comes to customer service uh, because it's easy to just say, oh, here's our 800 number, here's our chat box, um, just go there. Uh, it's, it's a whole other level of expertise required to be able to answer somebody's question when they're saying, well, you know, I'm giving you like, for some people, $100 is a lot of money to invest, right? And, and so, these, these little like task squads have for kind of, they have a life of their own, some of them. And I do think that to some degree they have, they have done exactly what you're talking about, but I don't think that outside of what has now become their own group, it's like they've become a closed group. Now, oh. most of the rest of the people mm. don't have access to their information. So it's like, it's like this cyclical thing of like more information. And then some people take advantage of the, uh, of the, it's like evolution. Like they, they're like, okay, let's do this crowdsourcing thing. And then they become their own group. Like Amazon was a startup and now Amazon is the giant. It's the same kind of principle in my mind. And so you have, plus you have so much information and you have, um, a lot of affiliates out there now that are working to basically promote sponsors or platforms and there's monetary exchange. So you, it goes back to that trust. How do you trust the person providing the information and do they have a financial incentive to provide that information? So transparency, yes, but also there's the possibility for misinformation, not necessarily on purpose, but because there's so much out there and a lot of different opinions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, look, the world has changed, hasn't it, out of here generally. 
right? I mean, yeah, uh, it's changed a lot. The opportunity. So I just think that it's going to flesh out. I really think that this industry, this new industry, real estate syndication online, right? Crowdfunding. Uh, the we'll really see what it looks like on the other side of the next downturn. Well, one of the things that I find really interesting about this space or, or the dynamic investment cycles, sales cycles, whatever you want to call them, they're long, right? So I invest today in a project, you know, I'm probably not getting a distribution, you know, at the end of the quarter and maybe my first distribution comes the quarter thereafter. And then I'm probably, you know, two or three more quarters until I really have a sense for what's happening, you know, at this property. But, you know, in most cases that first year can be, you know, pretty variable and, and uncertain. You know, and then you hear these stories, and, and this is something that really rubs me the wrong way of you know, sponsors basically overraising the amount of equity that they need. And then during that first year, you know, making sure they pay back six, eight percent pref to investors effectively with their own money, right? And then investors say, oh, the deal's doing well. They're not looking up under the hood, they're not looking at the financials, they're not looking at NOI. And you know, we live in this world where that just gets delayed. The, the uncovering of the underperforming deal gets delayed a year, two years, three years, at which point investors could be in three, four, five deals with one of these sponsors. And, and that's the real house of cards as, as I see it. And the thing that really troubles me as I see the way you know, some of these groups present their deals. So Dan, I'll tell you something. Hearing you talk like that is to me extremely reassuring. Because I sit here thinking if I am not just the uh, harbinger of gloom, right? When I think about the, the threats that there are to investors in this, in this new world. Uh, and you've touched on a few very, very important points. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of them is the idea of this current pay on a pref. This is brand new. Right? No one ever did that. And so the only way to do that is to raise more money than you would have done before, which puts pressure on the deal. Uh, and like you say, you're just paying investors back with their own money. I can tell you that, um, obviously not discussing any names, uh, but uh, I'm in a, you know, a couple of groups. And what I see is investors, and this is why I built this course to teach people. You know what? This is take this course for crying out loud. You're putting a lot of money in. Uh, but uh, I see people saying, you know, we stopped getting payments. We're not getting callbacks. We don't know what our rights. You know, I think I'm going to look at the contracts and see what our rights are. And it's the first time they do that is when things go bad. And suddenly they uncover all the things, Dan, that you know now and that you're uncovering now before you go into a deal right that's when you do it it's too late to go back into a contract when things have gone wrong and to discover you have no voting rights right for anything you that you only have rights to see the books once a year right uh you can't uh, you don't know who no rights to know who the other investors are so you can't even call a vote, even if you need, right? No mechanisms for, in other words, you might as well just have, you know, bet on the lottery. I don't know, you got more to, that's the wrong example. I like to tell people that think that way, you know what? Send me your money. I'm a nice guy, I'll look after it for you. Be all right, don't worry. You might as well, you know, you're giving it away. So, but the fact that you talk in those terms reassures me that I'm not the only person that thinks about it this way. There are people out there that are doing deals that have the same cognition uh, that, uh, you know, you got to be careful. You know, it's, this is high risk, high return, period. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges is what I'll refer to as the unsophisticated investor just doesn't know what to look for. And you know, I think the, the worst thing I ever heard, I was chatting with a group at a conference and, you know, I won't mention names, obviously they were doing a ground up senior housing deal and it was their second deal. Um, the first one was six months in and the deal was structured where they were paying a pref during the first year of the ground up development. And as an investor, how in the world do you think there is capital to be distributed on a ground up development deal? Like where's it coming from? Right. And like 
who knows? Listen, I hope that deal worked out. It's not something I followed. But at the end of the day, that, that's got disaster written all over it. And, and as a lawyer, I look at that and I think, that's got fraud written all over it. You know, that's, that's, a re- that's a real concern for the industry generally if things like that happen with any degree of frequency. And I'm not saying that's something that happens on every deal. But you know, even hearing it every now and again, you know, that's what really worries me about the sustainability of this space. Yeah. So let's look on the bright side of this same coin, right? And the bright side is that what is the benefit of investing in real estate? The benefits of investing in real estate is diversification, right? You've got, the, you've got a liquidity premium when you invest in stocks and bonds or REITs, right? You're paying more for the asset because you have liquidity in what is intrinsically an illiquid product. But in real estate investing, the kind that we're talking about, private real estate investing, there is the illiquidity premium, right? That's the the added benefit you get from higher returns from being illiquid. And we're never asking an investor to invest all of their money, right? You're not doing that. Just you're diversifying your portfolio, right? So a prudent investor is thinking, that they want to get into private real estate, not because they need the immediate gratification of monthly income, but because they are looking at wealth preservation and wealth uh, and, build, and to build wealth at the same time. And they are appreciative that the returns will come down the line. It's not the whole portfolio. It's a small portion. It's exactly as you know how you know, the great endowments have started to branch into alternative investments like real estate. They understand that some money is high energy, small return today that creates that steady passive income. But for the long term, uh, that they're going to invest in real estate, alternative assets like real estate for that true wealth building potential that it has and also for the potential that it has for passive income in the future. So it's when we talk about building a healthy financial foundation, real estate plays a role in doing that. And sometimes it can, it can uh, distribute uh, current cash flow. But in general, if, if I'm hearing you right, it's not necessarily the, the investment to look at for that purpose. It's more of a long-term play, look, unless you- maybe it's debt, unless we're looking at like hard money lending. Right. So look, if you are, if you are a, um, you know, if you, if you're a professional and you have a day job and you have a predictable future of steady income, for whatever reason that is, you know, my, uh, again, I get a bit personal. My father-in-law was a, um, a radiologist, right? So for decades, he knew year in, year out that he was going to have this income coming in from his professional career. And what he wanted to do was to prepare for retirement. And there are multiple, if you, if you've got income today from your main job and you have, uh, you, you cover your nut and you go on holidays and you're able to save, you don't necessarily need more passive income today, right? It's okay. You've got enough. What you want to be, th- and I'm, look, I'm not a financial advisor, right? So all the usual waivers, lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, accountant, whatever. Uh, but uh, anyway, so, uh, but what you want to be doing is to be thinking about, yeah, some of your investments today will be giving you a yield that will supplement your income today. But why not put some money away for the future as well, right? You're not going to be taxed on it today. You might be taxed on it when you're in a lower tax bracket in the future, Right? Especially if you're thinking really long term. And again, we're talking super long term, right? So uh, 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 with capital gains or income tax or whatever it happens to be, put it away. And that's the place for prudent real estate investment. It doesn't mean that, and we've been talking about, you know, Dan was talking about a senior housing project that was ground up paying pref current right? from day one, which is a wacky idea. But you can invest in deals that do pay current that make sense. like. Uh, you know, uh, an apartment, a value add apartment deal or, a, you know, a value add office deal where you have income, uh, but that income may not be so high today, but even in the, f- you know, in the future, you would expect it to grow. Again, with this mentality of a long-term perspective, uh, if you embrace that, 
for real estate as part of your portfolio. I think you will, certainly my personal experience has been, that's the way to build wealth. And suddenly you get gray hairs everywhere and you've got this real estate out there you bought and invested in tens of years ago. And you just think, thank goodness, I wish I'd have done more, right? No matter what it pain was that long ago, I wish I'd have done more and bought more then and uh, be reaping the true benefits now. Yeah. Well, you certainly have a wealth of experience and knowledge. And um, I wanted to jump gears just a little bit here because, you know, dovetailing on the fact that you, you have such depth of experience, you are creating courses, which you mentioned earlier, and you have a podcast, which you mentioned in passing. So for, for the benefit of our listeners too, if they want to learn more from you, because you know, obviously we could probably talk for days and days on end about this. Um, you know, what are your courses about? What led you to want to produce these courses, which I know are extremely in depth and, um, and then what you do with your podcast so that, you know, we're, we're providing even more valuable information for um, anybody that's listening. All right. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to give a commercial break <laughs> right now. It's great. Thanks so much. Uh, so if you, uh, so I built uh, some courses. They are very, very advanced. These are uh, extremely detailed courses that describe exactly how to look at a real estate crowdfunded deal, period. But they're not for the light heart, they're not for the faint of heart. This, these are not get rich quick, you know, no money down, do it all from your, you know, sofa type courses. These go through in tremendous detail, absolutely everything that you need to look at. By the end of it, you will have an advanced knowledge of everything that Dan and I are talking about. You will understand why, right? The things the three of us are talking about make sense. Uh, and those are courses that are for sale on my website. Uh, and then I also, I'm actually, I also, assist sponsors, as you know, to build their digital presence online. So I'm in the process of building a course. Actually, I teach people. I actually do it for you. At the moment, I've only had the bandwidth to actually do it for clients, for sponsor clients who want to raise money online. I show them how to do that. I build systems for them to do that. But I'm also building a series of courses so folk that want to do it for themselves can do it for themselves. So those are my kind of three core products. Right. And because you're really getting into, and there is a big difference, like there's a big difference between an online platform and even what alpha investing does, because we're not exactly an online platform and it, it you know, and then there's a more traditional like syndication where maybe a group of people get together and, and pool their money and, and do it that way. So there really is, there's such a wide variety of ways of finding information and investing. So you're really focused on like essentially how to vet a, an opportunity on a platform. Is that right? Am I getting that? Yes, right? that's okay. exactly right. And the, the, the course that I built for investors is nothing at all to do with this is go out and do it. You could take my course and be able to derive from it how to do it yourself, go out and buy and develop and renovate and build and whatever, finance your deals. But it's oriented specifically to investors uh, so that they know what to look for in a crowdfunded deal. By the way, let me just, I want to say, I applaud you for what you're doing because it's very rare, actually, that I speak to people that have the same outlook. And I remember this from when you and I spoke on the phone with Fark the very first time. Mm -hmm. and this conservative approach that you have to finding deals, to finding sponsors, uh, and to being really diligent on examining under the hood and, and what's there. And the very fact that you are putting together this podcast and sharing with your listeners the insights and knowledge that you have is extremely important. I, they need to know that, you're, that you are as conservative and prudent as you are, right? And the only way that they're going to know that is if you tell them, right? And that's exactly what you're doing in this podcast. So I really applaud you for doing that as well. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's really important to us to reach people the way that they also um, are reachable nowadays. You know, a lot of it has moved to podcasts and, and even video, which you're exploring. Um, maybe Dan and I'll get to video. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, you know, in a few months. But for now with the podcast, you know, we really are 
it's this idea of educating and forming and connecting with people in, in all sorts of, of different ways. And, um, you know, I'm not on the specific like underwriting team like Dan and, and Fark and Ann are. And yeah, they basically poke holes with jackhammers into every deal and, and like even every sponsor. And that gives me a lot of, it allows me to sleep at night. Um, and because, you know, as you do, we put our names behind what we're offering and it's no, um, it's no small thing to have somebody trust you with their capital. That's like hard earned. I mean, I know I don't like losing my money and I don't like losing sleep. So, um, you know, we take it really seriously and, and, and everybody does, right? Like there's a lot of new investors coming um, to the fore who are a lot of women too, who are like, hey, I'm responsible for my household spending and now I want to be responsible for investing. There's all kinds of people that are learning about real estate and they really don't know where to turn. Um, and there's a lot of good sources as, as you are. So anyway, I'm rambling, but what I'm trying to say is that it's meaningful to us to, to try to do our best both in our underwriting and then in providing this kind of information and like opening it up for, you know, the investor questions that, that we take. Yeah. Look, we've been talking for a long time, but let me make this point that, um, one of the biggest dangers that you can fall into, not you, but anybody in real estate is the F O M O, uh, problem. That's the fear of missing out. And when you see people around you making a lot of money and raising money and putting together funds and raising money and investors jumping onto the bandwagon, etc., it can be tempting to join that pack. And I have never done that. And you asked about 2005. It was tempting. Actually, it wasn't. I was never tempted. But I saw people chasing deals with unrealistic numbers and just never could make heads or tails of it. And so I would, again, I would applaud you for your resistance to that temptation also. Stick with your guns, right? <laughs> you know, don't worry. The, the good people, the good investors, the good the prudent investors and the quality sponsors, they will see you through. That's, that's the truth of it. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for all your time today, all your information and your, your expertise and, and your knowledge and your stories. Um, you've really given a ton of information that will benefit a lot of people. So, um, you know, we'll include links in the show notes and everywhere where everybody can go and find you and, and listen to you on your own podcast as well. So, for now, I think, um, I don't know if Dan has any other questions or um, at this point, well, I would just say thank you. Well, it would be great if you could let us know when the next 2008 is coming. <laughs> <laughs> around the corner. I'm sure of it. It's right around the corner. Uh, and, and we should also not forget to thank the, uh, the one listener who has left uh, listening to me after over an hour. We should thank that. <laughs> Thanks so much for sticking through to the end. <laughs> I'm actually really sure this one's going to get shared a lot and bring on even more people as they, as they come online, right? So again, thank you so much for all your time. We'll be looking forward to chatting again soon. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and found it both informative and insightful. We welcome all your questions and your feedback about today's episode. And especially, we welcome your questions about specific topics that you would like us to cover. So shoot us an email at podcast at alpha I.com. And if you have a moment, we really appreciate ratings and reviews as it helps us grow our online community and our interactions with you. And we'll also be linking to a number of relevant articles on topics that we might have touched on during our conversations. Some of them are broad, some of them are technical, but we're always aiming to provide information that helps you better understand the mechanics of building this healthy financial foundation, especially if you're looking to do this with real estate. Real Wealth, Real Health is brought to you by Alpha Investing a real estate-centric private capital network that leverages exceptional relationships to provide exclusive investment opportunities to its members. Historically, 
real estate has been the most effective way to generate passive income and build long-term wealth. By providing access to the right investment partners, information, and insights, we're empowering you to build your financial future. We appreciate all the positive feedback and participation. And if you're new, please subscribe to Real Wealth, Real Health on your favorite podcast platform, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and even Spotify.